welcome everybody this evening to the Tech Talk Club, the largest tech community here on Clubhouse that has over 450,000 members and is still growing. So we're always very excited to host with you, Chris, and appreciate that. Tonight's talk, Heated About Climate, the Policy, the Politics, and the you fill in the blank. Um, tonight we're going to have Bill Weil, who is the founder of Climate Voice and former green energy czar at Google and head of sustainability at Facebook, is going to be chatting with the amazing and inspiring climate journalist, Emily Atkin, who's also the founder of Heated. To kick us off, I'm gonna open um, up with a story to say that as I've been following the news, I'm sure just like all of you tonight, I just want to share that at this point, I am a bit tired and I am mad as hell. So as a mom of a teenager in high school and as a human rights policy advocate and a nature lover, I never actually dreamed or believed that I would live, let alone have my, see my, maybe my teenager I thought might live through this major climate uh, transition that we've been hearing about for years, but I never dreamed that we would actually be living it here in in, in our lifetime. Um, I have to say that if my, if my daughter Maya brought me home a report card like the IPCC report, I'm sure most of you in this room know what that is, um, the Earth's report card or the corporate scorecard, which has just been released by Climate Voice, which Bill and Jennifer will tell you more about later, I would be really pissed off and I would sit her down, look her straight in the face and say something like, can you look at yourself in the mirror and say that you put the work in? So I think we're at this point where we all realize we need to put the work in to improve this earth climate scorecard or, or our grades, our collective grades. So I'm excited because if we do this, we can create jobs and build a brighter future for ourselves and our kids. But yes, in fact, our lives do depend on it. The earth is going to go on without us. So stepping back a moment when Biden-Harris took on, won the presidency and many breathed a sigh of relief in the 2020 election, we watched as the new president boldly stepped in to reverse four years lost during the previous administration. He declared historic all of government approach to climate change. He issued sweeping executive orders, uh, including climate in our national security priorities. He required all agency risk and mitigation reports, a riveting read. Those plans have just been reduced and they are publicly available. So I urge you all to take a look at those to see uh, what the government and all the agencies are thinking of doing. Um, and also they convened a major climate summit right out the gate. Um, and they have proposed significant climate and human infrastructure legislation, uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and the Build Back Better Act, which now sits in the balance in Congress hovering somewhere between 1.5 trillion, 3.5 trillion, maybe around $2 trillion of investment. Uh, as we all sit and wonder where Senators Mansion and Cinema will land. So as we watch this process play out, I find myself getting even more angry when I think about fossil fuel lobbying power, its disproportionate influence, politicians who can profit from coal and the millions of dollars that have conflicting interests that are engaged in making this policy, and they can slow it down and put the brakes on it. And also, I'm angry that we have to worry about, you know, my own daughter and our kids' future. So, the lack of power and influence of this generation, the younger generation who don't yet have the votes but will bear the brunt of what we are doing, um, makes me wonder if we adults are not failing them in generations to come. But I am optimistic. Uh, after taking part in sessions like this and Climate Voice series led by Bill and Jennifer, which has masterfully combined urgency, science, optimism, and a dose of reality, and shared optimistic pathways forward with using existing technology and solutions to get to carbon net zero largely in time uh, from great scientists and thinkers like Dr. Michael Mann, the author of The New Climate War, and Saul, Dr. Saul Griffith, uh, author of Electrify, An Optimist Pathway to a Regenerative Future. Oh, forgive me. I hope I got that title right. Um, so we see businesses are greening their operations. They're beginning to grapple with risk 
impacting their bottom line. CEOs are signing joint statements and making declarations. But as we have gleaned insight from our very own Bill Weil himself, and I'm inspired by his action, who was once an insider in a major multinational corporation in big tech to be specific, where he was leading transformational sustainability efforts. And as you see, the corporate scorecard will illustrate, we cannot get to where we need to go without bold government policy. Bill and Climate Voice make the case, as many others in this fight do, that we can no longer rely on corporate voluntary action, that we need mandatory uh, changes. They have to be mandated. We need, moreover, accountability from both elected public officials and unelected corporate leaders, uh, shareholders, and investors alike. While the fate of the budgets and the climate provisions of the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better Act sit in the balance, we can dig in tonight. We are very lucky to have a very exciting, one of the leading climate journalists of our time, and Ms. Emily Atkin. Bill will introduce her formally to break down the challenges and the upsides of the media's and investigative journalism key role to help fight climate change, to frame and shape the debates that we all listen to, to providing balanced scientific-based coverage, to shining the needed spotlight, to ensure accountability on all sectors, and even to combat disinformation. And the media itself needs to be accountable. So we have a awesome multi-generational panel tonight. Well, thank you, Andrea, for mod moderating. It's always a pleasure to do these with you. Thank you, Chris, for hosting. I am thrilled to be here with Emily Atkin. She's an award-winning climate journalist. In addition to starting the climate newsletter he did, Emily is a contributing columnist at MSNBC and also a featured author in the Climate Solutions Anthology, All We Can Save. And I've really enjoyed reading Emily's work the last year or more. I particularly enjoyed that I have not been inside a company during that time. I'm not sure how it would have felt several years ago. She had been focusing her fire or ire on me, though I do think many corporate sustainability people um, welcome, you know, sort of the, the um, unflinching gaze of reporters and um, uh, activists. I'm particularly excited to talk to Emily today because earlier today we released a corporate scorecard evaluating where 20 of the largest U.S. companies stand on the Build Back Better Act. This legislation is a once in a generation or maybe once in a lifetime opportunity to pass meaningful national climate legislation in the U.S. And yet zero of these 20 large companies are fully endorsing it. Eight are offering cautious support and 12 are actively obstructing it. So, Emily, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And let's start. I'm just curious, in your opinion, from all the companies you've covered and people you've talked with, why is there such a disconnect between what nominally pro-climate companies say about climate action, even what they might say at a high level about climate policy and what they actually do when it comes to their lobby. Thanks for the question, Bill. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, really happy to be uh, talking with you. I think it's really great how you were once in these uh, in these big internal uh, corporate ESG settings and you're now doing this. Um, I think that's really admirable. Uh, I think there are a few answers to your question of why we see such a disconnect. Um, there are probably like three in my head. Uh, 
that I'm thinking the first is that it's really easy to say, it's much easier to say that you care about climate change or pro-climate than to actually do really tr internal transformational things that would actually make a difference for climate change uh, within, especially like a large tech corporation. Um, we tend to see things as sort of black and white. It's like, if you do one good thing, like, shouldn't that be enough? And it's just, it's not, unfortunately, we're sort of at a point with climate change where like, if you do one good thing, but if you have, you know, the ma massive power that corporations have, it's like one good thing is certainly not enough. Um, I think that also tech corporations uh, and most corporations, uh, probably every single one on that, on that list that you just released uh, is much more concerned. I'm sure you saw this in your position with that short-term dividend profit for their shareholders than the long-term uh than the long-term future of their company and the climate i think there's not really a recognition that um that if we don't do something really drastic about climate change um like these corporations are not going to continue to be as profitable because the world is going to fundamentally change. I think also they don't really see the opportunity in, um, in, in making transformational change. Um, and then the, the third thing really is that I honestly think that a lot of people in corporate uh, sustainability in particular really truly believe that they are doing enough. Um, I really think that there is a fundamental uh, and and prolific misunderstanding of how bad number one how bad and widespread the climate problem is uh number two how much corporate um sort of behavior drives that especially political behavior um we sort of live in a country where our politics are very much decided by money and who gives the most money to in politics, it's corporations. Corporations don't do anything about that. Uh, so I think they underestimate their own power to make a difference and underestimate the true scale of the problem and, and truly believe that, you know, through their tech or through their product, they can just, they can make a difference um, and, and that they are, but it's just, it, it's just not enough. I hope that was a good answer. <laughs> no, that's great. And it kind of summarizes my evolution over 15 years working on climate inside tech companies. You know, when I started, I didn't know much about climate. I learned a lot about the technology side. I learned about energy markets. And over time, I really came to appreciate the central role that <clears throat> public policy binding regulation has to play, especially since we've now spent the last 20 years not really putting in place the kind of policy we need. So that, you know, I've heard Al Gore say, you know, our decarbonization path 20 years ago was a nice gentle bunny slope and now it's a triple black diamond and we've lost one of our skis so the problem is much harder we can't get there just with the great things companies are doing it's not about what they can do it's about what we need um so i want to pivot a bit to your um uh, sort of path. You said every journalist should be a climate journalist. So can you say a bit about what got you into climate as something you feel compelled to cover and why you say that about every journalist? Yeah, I say that as from a place not of a a uh, person that's passionate about climate change, telling everyone that they should be pass passionate about climate change. Um, I sort of say that every journalist should and will be a climate journalist, whether they want to or not in the future. 
um, from my position as somebody who's passionate about journalism and has been for a very long time. Um, I, I never expected that I would be a climate journalist. It was definitely not my intention uh, when, I, when I graduated college and started looking for jobs. You know, my dream was to be a political reporter. You know, I wanted to report on policy and politics because I felt like that was what journalism was there to do, right? It was it was supposed to be there to help keep citizens informed about what's going on in their democracy so that they can make the decisions to, on who to vote for to solve the biggest problems we face. It just so happens it's very hard to get a job in journalism, especially political journalism. And in 2013, when I uh, was applying for jobs in Washington, D.C. I was like reporting at some like legal trade publication. Um, I saw a job opening for a climate change reporter and thought to myself, I bet it'll be way easier to get that job than it will be to get a political reporting job. <laughs> so, um, and it was true, I did get that job. And, you know, I was like, okay, I, you know, later I can transition into political reporting. You know, I care about climate change theoretically. Um, you know, I, I believe it's real. Like, it's it's a it's a policy it's a policy issue to report on you know so I was happy to do it, um, but you know my goal was still to become a political reporter. Sort of long story short here is that I I did become a political reporter and I quickly realized after you know three years on the climate beat going to politics reporter doing politics regular politics reporting doing that for a year I sort of realized that this was this that I was way more fulfilled to doing climate reporting I felt that it was way more important um, based on what I had learned about climate change. And, and I, and I just sort of started realizing, you know, even being a political reporter, I really wanted to cover more climate politics stories. And I found that the people around me, the other climate, the other politics reporters were super, for lack of a better word, ignorant about how climate change worked. And when I started thinking about, you know, what does that mean? If, if the political, if the people reporting on government who are supposed to be informing citizens about the biggest problems uh, that they face and the biggest problems that, you know, their lawmakers are supposed to tackle and they don't know anything about climate change. I was like, oh God, no, that's terrible. And then, so, you know, I go back to climate change reporting and I realized that everything is being put on climate reporters' shoulders. It's like, if you're a climate reporter, you have to cover uh, how climate change affects housing, you know, like, you know, how sea level rise is going to affect housing or like how climate change might affect education policy or healthcare policy or, uh, you know, or infrastructure or, um, you know, how climate change is affecting people's mental health, how, and then you also have to be well-versed on climate science and report on climate, uh, you know, how the science works. And I was just like, why are we the only reporters that have to do every single beat? Um, and no, and like, you know, it's not like the transportation reporter has to be well-versed on climate change or the, uh, healthcare reporter has to be well-versed on climate change. It just doesn't make any sense. The way we, the way we spread information about this doesn't make any sense. And so as a person who's passionate about journalism, I, I truly believe, especially as the climate crisis gets more and more visible and apparent in our day-to-day -day lives, if you're not reporting on it now, you're going to be reporting on it. It's going to be inescapable. You might as well just start doing it now uh, so that you're ahead of the game. Yeah, and actually get educated before you're really caught flat-footed. I mean, it's funny. Yeah, and don't, and, don't, and don't think you can read one, don't think you can read one story about it and become right. an expert. I mean, like, right. you know. I mean, I, I've been saying a similar thing and catching some heat for for in that i think everyone who cares about climate and wants to work on it, whatever they want to do be an entrepreneur be an inventor a scientist work on corporate sustainability and work from the inside like i did for for many years they need to be a climate activist because at its core, the climate problem is mostly, at least in this country, in this country, it is a political problem. It's not a policy problem. It's not a technical problem. There are issues there. But what is holding us up is the, the politics. So... Um, 
You've been very focused, and as I said, I, I think I'm half joking. I'm glad that you didn't have your sights on me when I was at Google or Facebook. <laughs> you're you're very focused on revealing corporate hypocrisy. So how have business leaders reacted to your coverage of their companies? <laughs> Uh, they uh, haven't, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes in my newsletter, I will, uh, you know, I'll do like a story about Microsoft, let's say that that's a, that's a big target of mine, right? Like Microsoft is probably the most climate forward tech company in that they have the most aggressive public facing goals. They say the most inspiring good things. Um, like the, the quotes that'll come out of Microsoft are exactly what you want to hear, really. Um, and they've got a bunch of great goals, but then they also put a ton of money, which is something I just reported on, into uh, reelecting Republicans and climate change deniers. Really like the people who will do anything to make sure that we don't in any way slow down our usage of fossil fuels, which is what causes climate change by far more than anything else, right? Um, they really, in their political activity, you know, for, for their own company, they, they're doing everything they can to make Microsoft as a company greener. But in their funding of the political system and their lobbying, um, you know, they put Microsoft's short-term business interests ahead of the climate and they reelect like the worst climate people and put a ton of money into it. Right. So I, I recently do an article about, um, about the money that they spent in this last quarter. It was like $500,000 towards climate scenarios or whatever, something like that. And I send Microsoft a, uh, a long email, like with, with questions. Right. And, you know, I try not to make it too long, but you know, it's a, it's got like, you know, five or six detailed questions. And I know that Microsoft <laughs> responds to some stuff. They responded to me before. They responded to some of my colleagues on stuff. You know, I've got the right email address for the right person. And and these are these are legitimate questions, right? <laughs> and uh yep. and and you get and you get a response, but it's a canned response. It does not it does not answer any of the questions. It's basically a response that I've got. It's literally the same response I've gotten from Microsoft before on some of this stuff. Uh, it, it's just a copy paste. And, uh, and so I'll send, like, I'll send my readers the exact wording of the, <laughs> of the questions I asked. And then I'll, and then I'll show them the exact wording of the response I get back. And I'm like, do you see, this is how they treat these questions. And then they just hope that the article doesn't make a big enough deal that they don't have to address it because to be exposed as hypocritical on this, and I think Bill, you probably know this better than most people. Um, it's not, it's very bad for business. You know, uh, people like to think that corporations do uh, climate friendly sustainability stuff out of the pure altruism of their corporate hearts. Right. And it's, that's not why um, <laughs> it, it surely can be part of the reason and surely many people in these uh, at the heads of these corporations believe that 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 is that they are being super altruistic about this. But it's also because it's, just, it's like the same with philanthropy. It's also because if you're like that and you're public facing about that, people want to buy things from you. That's that's in the research. Like it's very widely known and proven that if you are seen as a corporate do-gooder, people think that you're doing really great things for the climate, they will want to buy your products. And if they think that you're being an asshole about it, they won't want to buy your products. So I, that's why my, the responses I normally get are, are nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be yeah. Well, you know, when I was, I was on the inside and got calls from reporters asking awkward questions or from activists, NGOs, or more often emails, not calls. 
you know, if I answered without talking to our PR folks first, I would get yelled at. <clears throat> and if I did talk to them first, usually the, the, the advice was just ignore them or here's a canned response. So that's certainly from the inside what I often saw. Um, you know, but it, it will it will change, right? Like, but you probably know this too. It's like if there is enough hubbub, so to speak, about the yeah. article, they like corporations can be pressured. It's like it's the one I remember. I wrote an article about like Twitter's Twitter and its ad policy once, and how it um, how its ad policy like benefited oil companies while sort of silencing. Um, climate group so it allowed oil companies to like spread basically anti-climate messaging while it prevented climate groups from spent from uh spreading pro-climate messaging and for some reason like that article caught the attention of it, it created enough of a hubbub that it like caught the attention of elizabeth warren who tweeted about it ch tagged jack dorsey the ceo of twitter and then a couple days later uh twitter altered its policy like, yeah, like Jack Dorsey responded to it, and then they altered its policy. So it's really just about, in at least in my experience, it's about what the reaction from the public is. Simply publishing the story will will get nothing. But if you publish a right. story and people are like, "What the fuck?" That'll do something. Yeah, one well, I would say it's the public and its employees. So you mentioned mm. Microsoft. We've engaged with a number of Microsoft employees. Hundreds have signed our petitions. And when your recent piece on Microsoft came out, we shared it with that group. And that plus some of the other recent pieces about hypocrisy around climate from Microsoft got a lot of employees riled up. And that, I think, is a big part of the reason why Lucas Jope at Microsoft posted a little over a week ago that Microsoft now supports the, the climate provisions in the reconciliation bill. So the public matters, but you know these big companies that have in some cases virtual monopolies on the consumer side don't have monopolies on the hiring side and they compete mm -hmm. really hard for talent so that that is part of what we're trying to do i should say part of what we're doing not just trying um, uh, is engaging employees so that they understand the truth about what's going on with these companies um, so how do you strike a balance you know, or do you try to between making people just pissed off versus feeling really empowered to do something to pressure companies or politicians and so on? Or are you, you know, trying to get them pissed off enough that they latch on to something else and then to act on? Well, it's interesting you ask that question because, like, for so long, I didn't do anything to try to make people, like, you know, empowered about <laughs> about this stuff. You know, I was just sort of like, it's my job as a journalist to just at least expose the, uh, like, the Kool-Aid that these corporations have been trying to feed you, like, as as artificial and not natural right like and then you can decide what you want to do about it but then you know especially over the pandemic i came to realize that like and par partially through my own like defeatedness and like total burnout that like people need to understand that and then by example that uh that things that, that things can change that it's like absolutely possible to pressure corporations, politicians, uh, to, to change their behavior. Um, and so I started doing it in my, in my now weekly newsletter, um, 
I will start basically the newsletter with news examples from the week prior of activists securing big wins, like successfully pressuring um, a big university to divest from fossil fuels, um, successfully getting an insurance corporation to pledge not to fund any more tar sands projects, right? Successfully um, pressure it, you know, like uh, successfully getting Microsoft, for instance, to uh, to change their position on or, or come out in support of climate provisions and build back better, right? So it's like, I want, before I get people pissed off about something that some powerful asshole is doing, I want them to see new examples like every single day of activists who push and push and push and then they win. So before it's like all this bad news, it's like, by the way, it's not like, I've always hated climate quote unquote good news because I always feel like, <laughs> Climate good news is like, hey, we, uh, we, uh, you know, there's a new technology that someone's working on where they made, you know, biofuel from algae and that's cool. And it's like, it will never scale up and it's like not really a good climate solution. So I feel like a good way to mitigate total, uh, total just apathy on this and like throwing your hands up feeling is to show people that every day activists are being successful and that all they need to be more successful is more people. More people. And, you know, the point you made about persistence, um, you know, we've work, been working with employees at a few companies where some have asked, but, you know, if we, if we talk to executives, will it matter? And we went and had a meeting and we kind of got, you know, we got told all the wonderful things the company is doing and effectively told, go away. And <laughs> our, our response was, you know, one meeting won't do it. It's going to take time. It's going to take making clear you won't just take, go away for an answer and go away. And we're now seeing companies move. Um, you know, with the scorecard we just released in the last couple of weeks, as word started to leak out about it, we saw Amazon and Microsoft both step up, not as far as they need to be, but better than they were on climate policy. We saw Salesforce step up in there, I would say, well ahead of the other tech companies. <clears throat> and we actually saw Facebook go from completely silent to saying yesterday that they support the climate provision. So that's, you know, persistent activism by us, by employees, reporting by journalists like you. Here's the thing, though. It's like, it, if they say they support the climate provisions in there, that's great, right? But I think it's also really important to, and not, not to like, you know, say that, that this isn't a good thing that happened. It's great. But it's like, what people need to also realize is that a lot of corporations, politicians, people say they support the climate provisions in such and such, whatever, right? But it's not, if it's not their priority and they will vote no on that because because of something else that would affect their business in the short term, then then it doesn't matter, right? Like so, corporations Absolutely. are yeah, like corporations are inherently uh, they're inherently afraid to take any big risk to their short term profits, but they are also inherently uh, just really bad at thinking about long term risk to their to their profits. Climate change is the ultimate long term risk to every single one of these companies' uh, profits, right? But all they're yep. thinking about in the, in, the, in the now is that short-term risk. And that's why they're like, okay, we'll say that we, that we support these climate provisions, but if push comes to shove and, and, it, and the whole package has to get voted on, we'll say no to those, those to transformational change for the climate because we always prioritize our short-term profits. 
Yeah, no question. And I think, I hope, I believe that can change, but it is going to take a lot of pressure to overcome that focus on short-term profits and the belief that lower tax rates for companies are just a good thing. Somebody has to take a risk, you know, it's like someone has to take an ultimate risk. And once one company does it, that's the real thing. It's like, I feel like if you're an activist, a journalist, whatever, focus on the one company that's most likely to make that big risk. uh, Because once somebody does it, then it'll, then I, I believe just based on like reporting in the past on corporate change, then like dominoes will start to fall. There's a saying that if everyone understands what you're doing, then you're too late, then, you, then you're already too late to the, to the game. Um, so like just one big tech corporation has to make a move that nobody, under, nobody in the tech world understands why they're doing it, right? Like, why would you do that? Um, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I think now is a good time for me to pass the mic to Jennifer Allen. She's going to do a brief call to action. And then I think Andrea will uh, invite some other folks on the stage to uh, conversation. Thanks so much, Bill. And I think that, you know, as Emily sort of eloquently said, public reaction really matters, which is why we need the help of everybody in this room. We have 200 people in this room with us right now. And that's why we released this corporate scorecard to get the general public to push companies, to move these companies to fully endorse the Build Back Better Act. And there is still time where that corporate support, full-throated support for this legislation could still help move lawmakers. So I'm asking everyone, our call to action is please go to our website, gotimeforclimate.com. And there you will see a list of 20 companies. All of these companies are pro-climate. They have made statements in the past. They have been scored by Influence Map as um, supporting all sorts of climate policy. And then we scored all of them on whether they endorse the climate policies in the Build Back Better Act, whether they support revenue provisions to pay for those policies, because to Emily's point, it doesn't matter if you're not gonna really uh, support paying for it. And we are asking that all of these companies oppose the negative lobbying by their trade associations that is currently working to undermine this legislation. And for those of you who haven't been following it, the Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable are vigorously opposing this legislation. And these companies are not distancing themselves from those positions, even though they are members. So what we'd love you to do is to tweet at the executives at each of these companies, pick your favorite company, um, tweet at all 20 of them. All of you who have big Twitter followers, we need you to share this information, share the scorecard and ask them to leave. We have no leading companies on this list. There is no company out of the 20 that is fully endorsing this legislation. We just have reds who are obstructing and we scored um, companies yellow if they're supporting some of the criteria, but not all of it. So we are gonna be updating the scorecard in real time as company positions change, which is why your voice really, really matters. There's time to push them to shift to change before Congress actually votes. Please help us tell these companies that it is go time for climate. This is the best vehicle for climate policy. Back to Andrea to get to the rest of the stage and thanks so much for this great conversation. Thank you, Jennifer and Bill and Emily. I have already taken a quick look at that corporate scorecard and it is very eye-opening. It's the kind of dashboard that is really helpful when instead when you're sitting around having these conversations and doing work in the real world, it's great to have a dashboard sometimes to look to to see, you know, who's doing what. It makes you have a sense of who to reach out to to empower yourself. I'm going to throw to Caroline Spears. Welcome to the stage. So excited to have you here. Hi, y'all. It's so nice to be here. Thanks so much for having me. And this scorecard's great. If you haven't checked it out, go to Climate Voice, check out the corporate scorecard. You'll be shocked at some of the companies that show up on this. Uh, Tesla's on the list of folks do, not doing enough. Definitely check it out. I highly recommend it. Um, so, yeah, my name is Caroline Spears. I run Climate Cabinet. 
Um, we help candidates run, win, and legislate on the climate crisis. And we also have a data set on how uh, we track how 3,000 politicians, uh, state legislature politicians, are voting on every major piece of climate legislation. So scorecards meet scorecards. And I'm so excited to be here. Um, Emily, I'd love to hear from you about um, state level policy. You mentioned you know, reporters needing climate reporters needing to know so much about so many different topics. What's the data that journalists need to talk meaningful about state level climate policy? And what challenges have you had in kind of state level coverage and getting reporters interested in that? Great question. I would say that state level policy is probably one of the most important uh, areas of, of climate policy that most people aren't paying attention to. And the, the state level policy that is definitely, in my opinion, the most impactful is there are a lot of different municipalities, local governments trying to ban gas hookups in new buildings. I know it sounds like such a snooze fest, but this is basically deciding the future of whether or not cities and states across the country are going to have, you know, you build a new building, that building is there for 50 years at least, right? So is that building going to run on clean electricity or is it going to run, is going to be heated with natural gas? Is it, is it, and are there going to be a bunch of gas stoves in it? And th these sort of policies that are being passed, uh, like especially all across California, are really, you know, deciding the future of the fossil fuel economy. If, if, all of these areas are saying no, no gas hookups in these future buildings, then, then that's it. Then that's basically like taking a pipeline out of the, out of the ground. Um, and so in response, the gas industry has sort of launched this campaign uh, all over the country to pass laws saying to pass laws superseding these, these uh, electrification policies saying you cannot pass a law here that bans natural gas in new buildings. Um, and that's a huge priority. I think in the last year, um, like, 50, uh, like over 50 of these, uh, of these anti-electrification gas industry led policies has, have passed. Um, Rebecca Lieber at Mother, uh, not at Mother Jones anymore, at Fox is doing a lot of the reporting on that. Um, but the only challenges to this report, there are, there are, people are willing to talk about it. Um, people are, people are falling over their seats to talk about it. Honestly, the, the obstacle to this reporting is that more of it needs to get done. Um, and so I would say it, no matter where you live, look up and see if there's a, an electrification gas industry led electrification, uh, anti electrification policy happening. Cause it's, it's very likely that, that there is, and that's something that, that you can do something about. And Building companies that, that do ahead. business in those states that have influence shouldn't be sitting by idly while those state preemption laws are enacted. Those laws are truly evil. And I agree with you, Emily. Those could lock in emissions for decades that we just can't afford. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, agree with you, Bill. Uh, take a quick moment to shout out just a reminder that people making those policies are elected by us. So in addition to all Jennifer's calls to action, please just don't forget to vote. Register to vote. Get a friend to register to vote or to vote. And with that, we're going to bounce around the stage. I am going to throw to Auden next. Welcome, Auden. Yeah, Auden Schendler from Aspen Skiing Company, Sustainability. Uh, Emily, you're awesome. Uh, I'm on this show to hear you talk and your work has been incredible. Bill, you know I think you're incredible, so thank you. Um, you know, what I've been struggling with lately is I get asked constantly, what can I do? What can I do from individuals? And really this question is boiling down to how do revolutions happen and how do we be part of it? Because um, this tool 
that you guys have to bug corporations is awesome, but we don't have a movement um, at the size we need. And the, the other fear I have, so, so one question is, how are we gonna get that level of mass movement? And the other question is, I have this terrible fear of winning in a way that is losing. And an example would be that we pass a small carbon tax um, that's teeny and doesn't matter. And because of the way the legislative process worked, we gave up regulation and legal liability. And we won carbon tax, but we lost. And some of what we're seeing from the corporations, um, the corporate wins that you're describing, Bill, they say, well, we support it now. Are they in Washington? No. Did their CEO write a letter on, in the Wall Street Journal? No. Uh, are they actually doing anything? Emily, you brought this up, that there has to be an intensity to it. No, they're not. So you won, but we didn't win. And so I guess the question is, how do we get to scale? What are the things that individuals can do? And, and ultimately, how do, we, how do we get these corporations to actually feel the pain? Because Emily, a lot of your reporting, I'm like, wow, that must really piss off Microsoft or whoever. And they're like, eh, we don't care, we're in power. So I know there's a lot in there. You can riff on whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you for that question. It's a super easy question to answer. <laughs> and <that> is... <laughs> it was like a stoner rant. No, it was, I mean, but it's, those are, those are, those are the questions, right? I mean, if I had the, if I had all of the answers to them, uh, I don't think I'd be doing journalism. Um, but I think I'd be president. Um, but I, I do think that there is, we, we are sort of plagued again by black and white thinking, people believing that there is like one thing that they can do if there's just like one petition they can sign or one law that they can pass that that that's the thing that they should do and if they don't if they don't know what to do there then uh then they won't do anything instead of taking the lessons that like climate change itself is is teaching us and it's just like you make climate action a persistent part of your life if you have the privilege to do it and climate action is not uh it's not really um focused on maybe if i just buy an electric car and become part of the market and like get a reusable cup then i'm doing climate action it's like climate action is pushing for those systemic changes and so it's like however you can work it into your life like refusing to take a job that you know is for a company uh, that that uh is polluting the planet if you have the privilege to be able to do that it like requires just sort of being like all right like my basic principle in life is that uh i'm going to prioritize the climate wherever i i can um and that's going to look different for a lot of people a lot of people are not going to have like the privilege to prioritize that in their daily life but there are a lot of other a lot of people especially in the United States who can and just like choose not to. Um, but I also think, you know, with, with your fear of winning in a way that's losing, you know, I, I, I have that fear too, but I also don't because I don't think that uh, people are going to take it after a while. Like maybe we'll win in a way that's losing in you know, in the next couple of years, but the climate crisis is going to keep getting worse, right? Um, and if that does happen, and as it keeps getting worse, more and more people are going to be like, what the fuck? And you're going to get that 3.5% of people that we were just talking about. Um, I think <laughs> my biggest thing about, about climate change is I really think that people underestimate how bad it's going to get. Like, I, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, gloom and doom about it, but it's like people not only underestimate how bad it's going to get, they underestimate how people are going to react to the people who didn't react, who didn't, who are responsible, who kicked the can down the road now, once it does start to get really, really bad. I mean, and it feels stupid to say that because I'm like, as if it's not really, really bad right now. It is. But 
people can't imagine it getting worse and <laughs> it will get worse. Um, but the good news is that like, there are way more people who are not <laughs> individually causing the cr climate crisis than people who are you know, like the people, who, the decision makers at these big polluting companies, like the lawmakers in, in Congress, um, there are like way more people than them. <laughs> and all you have to do is find one thing that constantly pushes for systemic change. And if everyone who had the privilege to do it did that, I think we also underestimate what an impact that could have. But most of us just like are like, if I can't find the one petition that's good, then I'm not going to sign anything and I'm just going to be sad. <laughs> like, I don't know. I have a lot more hope than, than, uh, than I think a lot of other people do. I don't know if that was a good answer, but that's my answer. It was good. Thank you. Yeah. And Auden, um, thank you for the kind words and you have been, been a leading voice in the wilderness of corporate sustainability for a a long time. Um, I share your fears, but I, you know, our only choice is to act. And I would agree with Emily. <clears throat> it's going to get worse because we know there's already more warming baked in. Whatever happens this fall in Washington won't be enough. So we will have to do more. So it's not about, oh, we won, we're done. It's not about with well, Microsoft, they made a statement, we won. I see their statements as progress, signs they can be moved, and that we have to keep pushing hard so that they don't stop there. We're building a movement of employees and believe that can be particularly powerful in companies that compete hard for talent. Um, but I think whatever you know, community you can help build a movement in, all of them, all of them, I think, really matter. Thank you, thank you, Bill. So we're going to go to Jamie. Great. Thank you all for having me. And Emily and Bill, I mean, I really heated and climate voice are two of a handful of things that have, you know, in the climate world that have that have happened in the last few years that, you know, I, I think are really meeting the moment. Um, so huge admirers of, of both of your work. And Bill, you know that, Emily, it's great to be able to tell you that. Um, so Jamie Alexander, I run something called Drawdown Labs at Project Drawdown. Um, and I've spent most of the last month um, kind of asking slash threatening slash strong arming um, the corporations that I work with to fully endorse the Build Back Better Act um, and other climate policies over the years. Um, and the response, as you alluded to, is almost always, you know, thanks for sharing. I'll forward this along internally. Um, and then the crickets. Um, and I think, you know, it's far too easy for a company to say no when those decision makers can hide behind the facade of a corporate logo. And these big, big systems can make it feel like we're all kind of shouting into the abyss. Um, so my question for both of you, for Bill and Emily, um, you know, in this last all out push we're all doing um, from the inside and the outside to get full, you know, full throated corporate support on the full package, who do you each most want to reach? So Emily with your reporting and Bill with your campaign, um, and then for those of us in the room tonight who, you know, many of us who, you know, work inside large corporations or or have inroads with them, who should we all be targeting specifically um, roles or groups, you know, who can um, just who can make decisions or influence the decision makers? I'm I am targeting. So I say this all the time. I go to like journalism conferences and everyone is fixated on talking like how do we convince the climate deniers to. <laughs> to to uh not deny climate change anymore i'm like who cares you know <laughs> like i i uh personally i don't believe that i don't believe that it's worth targeting sort of those people i think there are a ton of people who care about climate change in theory the same way that i used to care about climate change in theory before i was a climate reporter 
who just need to know more details of how companies kick the can down the road and how they like very brazenly prioritize their short-term profits over uh, people's long-term health while, you know, running a hundred million dollars worth of ads a year about how much they prioritize people people's health. Um, so I really find that the best targets and where I've seen the most action is when you can target people who already care. They just need to learn something that's going to make them pissed off enough to get into that next tier of, of wanting to do activism. Um, I also think that for people inside corporations trying to push for change, um, what we really need to see all around is more, more courage, um, not only to make a bigger push internally if you see something, you know, immoral, but to utilize your best, you know, your best friends in democracy written into the First Amendment, which are journalists. Um, if you see corporate leaders like doing something immoral and you're pushing for it and, and they're giving excuses, ha have the courage to leak some of that stuff. This is the most important thing that you could be leaking, right? Uh, I constantly see people underestimating their own power and under people think this isn't important enough. Like no one would be interested in this story. I, I constantly, am, whenever I'm talking to a source inside like a company or inside government or, or wherever, who is telling me the best story, like I cannot believe I'm getting this like juicy, great information to be able to tell the public. They're constantly also saying, I don't know if this is important, but I don't, this is probably not important or I don't see why anyone would, would want this. Uh, like trust your gut about that stuff use journalists, um, have courage and don't care about those people that like aren't in the arena with you actually caring about climate change. Um, you know, you focus on people who care and make them care enough to act. Act and vote, get off the fence and into the arena. I love it, Emily. Thank you so much for that question. I just want to remind people to check out our website. We've picked 20 companies on purpose because they all do care, to Emily's point. They are all, quote unquote, climate positive, according to Influence Map. They have supported climate policies in the past. They publish beautiful sustainability brochures. They're constantly trying to get credit for what they're doing in their operations, but they are missing this moment. They are cautiously supporting Build Back Better or they're actively obstructing it through their silence or through their trade associations, and we need to push them. So we have 20 candidates, and we'd love all of you to push all of them equally. Thanks. And if, Andrea, if I could jump in quickly to Jamie's question, um, I think these companies have in some ways staked their reputations on being pro-climate. And, you know, Emily, you talked about how climate forward Microsoft is. And all of the companies on our list of 20, honestly, have made a big point about being pro-climate action. And I think in this critical moment around this bill in Washington is a great time to highlight what really looks like hypocrisy and hold them to account. So employees need to actually pay attention to what's going on. The general public does. Journalists do. Too few journalists are doing what Emily is doing. Politicians who care about climate need to be holding these companies accountable. And if the companies believe people are watching and people care, they will move. Thank you, Bill. Next, let's go to Jeff. So excited to have you here. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Jeff Nesbitt I, with Climate Nexus. Uh, folks at Nexus spend 
a lot of the time trying to convince Emily to, to work on some of the great stories she works on. That natural gas versus renewables fight, she's exactly right. That is a fight to the death between the renewable energy side of the equation and, and the oil and gas sector, and the fight is in your, in your kitchen and in your boiler room, um, and it is, um, it, you know, it's, it's analogous to the, the during the tobacco wars, um, no, none of us discovered this until later, that, that the tobacco companies knew that when they saw that cities were beginning to ban smoking in public spaces, they stacked all of their, the, the commission meetings and all the city council meetings with supporters to try to keep it from happening. Um, I don't think the oil and gas sector has gone quite that far with the natural gas um, versus renewables fight, but um, they know that, that, that the fight is real and it's existential for them. My question for you, so I, I have to be a little bit careful here because I actually today, in fact, in a Chatham House, had a chance to talk to the chief lobbyist and as well as chief sustainability officer for one of the uh, 20 companies on your list. Um, it is not one of the big tech companies, and you might be surprised by a couple things. One, they know a great deal internally, I mean a lot internally, about the climate risk and that their company is facing, their industry is facing, and other companies is facing as well. I've also had a chance to talk to leadership at a number of the other companies on that list as well, and what they all say uniformly is they genuinely seem to, to believe that they can support the climate provisions in the Reconciliation Act, in the Build Better Act, um, and they just you know, turn a blind eye to what the Chamber of Commerce is doing and the Business, business Roundtable is doing, which is to bring the entire bill down. So, um, and then when you challenge them on it, it was, well, we're, we support the climate provisions. We've told our, our leadership and our lobbyists that they need to make sure that they support the climate provisions, but completely ignore the fact that um, the climate provisions won't exist if the entire reconciliation bill doesn't cross the finish line. Companies, especially the biggest companies, love the fact that the entire focus on having to do something about the climate problem is up to governments, whether it's national or state or local, and consumers where they can blame shift. When the truth is, the hard action is probably going to need to be taken by the companies themselves. So I think once um, we get through this next COP, when China doesn't come to, to the table with something serious, um, and potentially India doesn't either, and Brazil doesn't even show up, and we see that governments probably won't get the job done, the, the, the focus needs to turn back to companies. So my question, Emily, is how do we actually genuinely turn up the heat beyond what you're already doing with some of these companies on the hypocrisy level? Well, first of all, what the hell? That is, <laughs> that is some that is some wild information sharing. Like, like to 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 say to me that like yes, you you have talked and and you to these people and you have really come away knowing that they understand this risk and like, and and you're basically telling me like oh it's not that they misunderstand the long term risk they understand and they're like but we and we like support the climate provisions but you know these other ones too and it but but you know not just not these other ones but then also being unwilling to recognize exactly what you just said the fact that like if the whole thing doesn't pass it then all of those provisions are dead what i'm hearing from you is the disconnect is not understanding that it's now their responsibility to figure out how to separate the climate provisions from everything else if they don't like other things in there fine but then they have to be the ones to to pressure uh like congress to remove those climate provisions and make it separate and they are not willing to do that right um and so you know my i don't know how to solve all problems right like it, it, that's definitely not why i got into journalism i got into journalism because i believe that journalism is our greatest tool for solving problems, right? Um, and so when I hear that from you and you're like, and then how do we address that? I'm like, oh, so we just need more journalism that exposes, uh, we need more information that basically exposes what you just said, which is that um, these companies understand the risk, they say they support it. And then when you're like, okay, so are you gonna push for the, like these provisions to be separated? Are you gonna make sure we elect more people who separate it? Are you gonna condition your support? Are you, are you gonna participate in the electoral process? Or are you just gonna put out a statement that says I support this, but not that, and if it fails, whatever. And, and so far, it seems like the answer is, is no. Um, 
and they have no external pressure to become actual corporate citizens who participate fully in the in the democratic process. So, you know, <laughs> learning about that, I, I don't know exactly what the answer is, but my <laughs> my answer is always going to be just like, oh, then we need to do stories about that. Like, definitely, people need to. I think you should just like pitch that story to people. Like, even me, I don't know. Like. That would be <laughs> club, clubhouse serendipity, Emily. We got a scoop in here in the climate voice room, and then you made a splash. <laughs> totally. Thank you. Well, keep us posted. You have to back channel us if that happens. Um, thank you, Jeff. A pleasure to meet you. Thanks for pushing the envelope on these issues and getting the press to cover these important topics. Uh, we could do a whole separate room on uh, how to make sure the media invests more in this type of coverage. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But at the moment, I will defer to Maya Penn for the last question. So Maya, welcome. If you could introduce yourself for everyone. So excited to have you here. I've heard you talk in other rooms and love to get your um, thoughts and questions for Emily, Bill, or anyone else in the panel. Thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you to all the mods, Jennifer, Emily, Bill, Sarah, Chris. This has been in really a really incredible conversation. And, you know, I just before I jump in, I just want to say, Emily, I appreciate how you're really, you know, just showing and, you know, kind of just exposing the underbelly of, you know, a lot of these industries like that. That makes a huge impact, you know, because some so many people just don't realize what's going on behind the scenes and how it's affecting our world. So thank you. Um, my name is Maya Penn. I'm a 21 year old environmental activist. I've been an environmental activist since I was eight years old. So I've been in this space for 13 years now. I focus a lot on corporate social responsibility um, I'm also an, an author and a three-time TED speaker as well. Um, I've done a lot of work as a sustainability consultant. And, you know, I've consulted um, everyone from startups to Fortune 500 companies, mostly kind of in the retail space, um, the fashion space, and, you know, kind of everything around that. And, you know, I, I wanted to hit a couple of, of really quick points and I don't have a specific question but if anyone on the panel had any sort of thoughts or or you know expertise or insights to add on to this um, that would be much appreciated. M Maya, I, oh, Maya can I just pause one second sorry to yes. interrupt you just to share that I know we have Emily for probably another maybe three to five minutes max so if you have anything that you want to direct towards her if not a question but a comment I would just mm -hmm. suggest you pull that to the top thanks got it I'm down to hear what to what Maya has to say by the way yeah thank no, you yeah I appreciate that and thank you so much um I think that you know one of the biggest issues and Emily I believe you spoke to this earlier was you know for you as a journalist, you see the different siloing of topics, you know, across journalism. And I think that businesses also have a tendency to silo different issues and areas um, that they need to be focusing on. And for, for example, I'm someone who's a, a firm believer in the connection between, you know, social issues and environmental issues, as I'm sure we all are. And you have many businesses separate, you know, DEI over here, and then ESGs over here. And it, it's like they are so deeply intertwined. I feel like if more businesses recognize that, then they would do more meaningful work on both sides or take more meaningful action on both sides. Um, and I, I think the, the second part to that question or the second part to that comment is um, how can we get the, the general public and more businesses to to understand the connection between these different topics? I'm someone who speaks a lot about environmental justice. I do a lot of work in Haiti, Senegal, Somalia, Cameroon. Um, yesterday was Indigenous People's Day. And, um, you know, despite uh, Biden recognizing this, you know, there's still thousands of fracking permits that, you know, are on track to be approved by this administration um, that are adversely affecting Indigenous people. And so th there's like, a, there's a big gap in that and I think that addressing both sides would really make a, a greater impact because there are already so many solutions within Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. So that was multi-layered. <laughs> I apologize if that was a little long-winded. 
No, no, you're totally good. And I'm, I'm honestly like, I'm so, I'm hearing you like talk about what you've done. I'm so impressed. Um, and I hear that and I totally understand that frustration. And my immediate thought listening to you talk about that was just thinking about how, <laughs> for lack of a better word, shitty um, our educational system is on, uh, on climate change, on like living in reciprocity with our environment. How about like, like the, the siloing that you're talking about is basically, it, it's reflective of how we have been taught as a society about environmental issues for our entire lives. And especially how, uh, you know, older generations, I'm a millennial, I'm turning 32 in a couple of days. Um, and you know, but especially generations older than ours have been taught that like environmentalism is separate from other things because the environment does not include us. The environment is a tree. The environment is the beach. Like the environment is not me and you and our society. And like, we are not interconnected. Right. Um, and that is a product. So when you see in these corporate spaces uh, and the separate, the siloing, of climate change uh, when you see, you know, an administration that says, when you see an administration that says we care about climate change and yet is doing all these other things in these other spa spaces, that's, that to me is a product of a bad educational system uh, that doesn't actually teach us from a young age how interconnected we are to the environment. Um, I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking about um, this, really great podcast that just got released uh, by Drilled and Earther. It's called the ABCs of Big Oil. And I really recommend anybody listening right now to, to take a listen to, to this about how the oil industry uh, has like infiltrated and shaped our public educational and private educational system um, from, you know, for, for the last like five, six decades, really. And thus shaped society's thinking about climate change. Um, and I honestly think that stuff like that really starts to help explain why we see these disconnects that we see. But then also, when, once you understand the problem, you also understand the solution, right? So it's like, if you understand that this is an educational problem, then you understand that we need a re-education. You understand that, like, at, in all these areas that you're talking about, like, there needs to be someone or something that comes in and, and reteaches uh, people how to think of the environment and humans as the same damn thing right um and also talking earlier about like what can i do if you're an educator if you're in any way in the educational system adjacent to it at all if you have a say in your school board representative right like make sure climate change is getting taught in the way that you want it to get taught because this is if you if you're taught about it from a young age in in the wrong way it, it'll affect how you operate on it for the rest of your life. Um, so thank you for the thoughts. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That is a very powerful closeout, Emily, coming back to my favorite topic, which is don't forget to vote. <laughs> don't get involved in your local, uh, you know, local city, local school board, you name it, get involved. Maya, you are amazing. And what I see on the stage, Bill and Jennifer, is that we have, you know, we have these young women leaders, which I think is so exciting that are working uh, in the United States and all around the world, you know, following the heels of whistleblowers. So it's just so amazing. Emily, thank you so much. I just want to defer to Bill and Jennifer to, to send you off for the evening as well. Bill and Jennifer, you want to welcome and thank, uh, jump in and thank Emily too? Absolutely, Emily. It's been a pleasure. We really appreciate your joining and sharing your stories. And keep up the good fight. We all need more good trouble. And I just want to plug for everybody in the room to follow Emily's newsletter, Heated. As her tagline says, it's for people who are pissed off about the climate crisis. It is incisive and funny and important. And so, Emily, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you guys for having me. It was great. Thank you, Emily. I just want to 
flag Daniel Blackman down in the corner. Um, he's involved in climate justice stuff in Georgia and is doing some work with Bernice King. Quick, quick uh, connection making clubhouse style on the platform. So just pointing him out to you. Thank you so much. And uh, we know you can make your French exit and leave quietly, but we really appreciate it. This has been <laughs> I'm getting great feedback about this room. So thank you very much um, and look forward to hearing you on Clubhouse again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Daniel, if you uh, want to tell the organizers, uh, give them, give you my number and, and we'll connect. Uh, but thanks for having me, everybody. I appreciate it. And um, I'll see you next time. Thanks, Emily. And then for everybody else in the room, uh, we have about another 10 to 15 minutes, but we have such amazing people here on the stage. The conversation is great. And so I would like to throw to Daniel next. And then I would like to invite Chris, our host uh, in Tech Talks, if you have a question or you want to make a comment. And then Sequoia and Jonathan. And then it's a wrap. Uh, if we can keep the comments short, maybe to a minute. Um, that would, oh, goodness me, Kevin Martin has just entered. We might have to bring him up on the stage too. Uh, back to you, Daniel. Uh, love, love that you are here. Thank you so much. Love your photo. Is that your son or daughter? Oh, that's my daughter. I, I just had a daughter, so no. And shout out to Maya. Congrats. Um, thank you. But I, I, I met Maya when she was 10. So to see uh, this come full circle with all her accomplishments, it's um, really dope. Maya, we're proud of you. We're, we're supporting you in so many ways. But um, I'll keep my comments short because I think a lot has been said tonight. And for me, <clears throat> I would just encourage everybody to focus on, you know, making sure that people that are the most disenfranchised and um, don't have the information. I think it was um, the gentleman that asked the question earlier was was Auden. Um, and, I, and I hope I said your name right, sir. But when he talked about movement and a lot of these areas, you know, I'm, I'm very much involved with the current administration. And and one of the more high level conversations I've had, um, my concern was not trading out. Um, advancements uh, in, you know, renewable energy like electric vehicles for um, by cutting public transportation, for example, because a lot of times um, the trade out, unfortunately, is not always at the top. It really affects people that are at the bottom and a lot of people that can't um, afford that market. We have to make sure that we are staying on top of um, these organizations and our elected officials. Um, as Andrea mentioned, I do a lot of work with Bernice King who's a daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. And we do a lot around equity. And so we're actually creating a climate equity task force that will focus on making sure we're monitoring these areas, but also focusing on educating the community and bringing coalitions together that might not have traditionally been at the table as it relates to climate. Is that national, Daniel, or in Georgia? Sorry. It, it's going to be a national initiative we roll out. We're following the infrastructure bill very closely and we're currently um doing it from six cities but including atlanta so atlanta memphis birmingham uh houston texas and i think montgomery alabama so you know our whole focus is making sure that a clean energy transition is equitable and um i also manage um acon's black sunrise fund so like we do a lot with raising a fund that helps to deploy capital to um, black men and women specifically, but you know, communities of color that want to help on the conversion rates of like converting coal fire plants, for example, to renewable energy facilities. So we're doing a lot to drive investments into communities that have been disproportionately um, impacted by these areas so that we can rebuild the communities without having to gentrify them. So we're doing a lot, but you know, the, these conversations are important. Thank you, Daniel. And I'm just wondering, do you engage any of the corporations you should check out this corporate scorecard that climate voice put out and see if any of those corporations that they've flagged uh and also check out influencer map but um see if um there are any uh overlaps with uh companies that you're working with or, or any angles to push with them perhaps through your stakeholder network a hundred percent and do me a favor just shoot me a text you have my number so send me a text with the information and um and we'll follow back up with it but i definitely appreciate the resource thank, thank you guys thank you daniel always a pleasure to have you here 
uh, you are an important climate voice, uh, as I have known since I joined Clubhouse. So um, I'd like to throw, we have uh, two other amazing, we have three other amazing people up here on the stage. Uh, look at the time, 8.55. We're going to have to go rapid fire, guys. Sequoia, and then Jonathan, and then yeah. Kevin Martin. I'm going to give my, st my time to Kevin and Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Sequoia. Thank you for coming. Jonathan, it's been such a long time. Welcome. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me up and for hosting the room and to all the speakers you've had today. And uh, I'll support everything that I've heard here today and encourage people to, uh, as I heard a, a couple of times, um, say it's going to get worse, and uh, we know that, and encourage people to do serious long-term thinking um, because we must think multi-generationally. Yes, and. Yes, now, and yes, and. Uh, that we can and should be doing both of those as a, uh, as a person who's been experiencing this for decades now, uh, both within academia and as a scientist, as an ocean scientist and technologist. Um, it's the only way that we're going to be able to really fix this is by taking what we have now, acting now, uh, and thinking long term. The other piece of it I think is so important is as we try to bring other people on the journey of understanding around this subject. Understand that we've learned so much in the last few years about how to influence people, what works, what doesn't work. And something we know, have known for a long time is that we can't just explain the sort of impacts of, of the, the things around the science. We have to have people who understand the science. Everyone has to have a, a fundamental understanding of how the universe works, how these things work, for them to truly uh, come along and and get on board on this journey that we're on. And we just haven't done a good enough job with with that on science education. And and I mean more than just our, you know, I effing love science memes in social media. We we have to go just a bit deeper than that. So I encourage people who who haven't done that to go out and do it. And people who have done that, um, you know, start with something like the Calvin cycle. If you don't know what the Calvin cycle is, then you probably don't know enough about the science to help bring other people along on on, uh, on climate. So learn about it yourselves uh, and then help other people learn it. Thank you again for uh, hosting this all. No, thank you, Jonathan. It's always I always like to get the oceans people involved in these conversations because Remember, it's not just a green new deal we need, but we need a blue green new deal. We ocean is key to uh, reducing uh, or sequestering carbon. It's responsible for two thirds of our breaths, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Very important uh, to get the ocean people and the environmental folks working together. So I'm so excited when I see that happen here on the stage. What a better way to, there could be no better way than to throw to Kevin Martin, uh, a good friend from a long time here on Clubhouse, uh, representing our indigenous communities. And um, of course, we are going to, after Kevin introduces himself briefly, and then we're going to throw to Bill and Jennifer to wrap up, summarize, and a final call to action. And Kevin, um, I'm so sorry. There's been so much that's happened in Washington. I can't wait to hear about uh, what you've been up to recently, but we are going to be wrapping up probably in the next um, three to five minutes. Unfortunately, we have a slightly hard stop. So we'll reach out to you for future rooms uh, on this, but welcome and uh, over to you. So nice to see you. Well, thank you very much. It's such a, a buildup. <laughs> Hopefully I don't disappoint. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to see all of you, actually. And the conversation is, uh, I think every time it goes through another iteration, we pick up new information. You know, really taking a look at uh, <clears throat> climate change and current policy, um, I'll, I'll just mention a few things that I, I see uh, in the mix. Uh, the United States auto industry um, talking about going going into um, electric in a bigger way pushing in billions of dollars well that subsumes that there will also be electric infrastructure in place hopefully um, 
that that those machinations will continue in in the American highways and and so on and so forth. It's interesting to see who's going to be jockeying for position. I see right now that uh, uh, the American oil is in a panic, as they usually are, um, and and I really don't see bioplastics stepping up to to match um, the game that is at fo afoot. Um, that has to happen. And until China Dream and China Road is, is actually seen for what it really is, rather than a military um, affront, um, and perhaps they are in some sense, but at the same time too, if one takes a look at the green, and, green um, cities that have been built with smart technology, et cetera, et cetera, they are years ahead of us. And the policymakers know that. And so um, anything that comes to the United States by way of uh, mass transportation, um, you know, certainly China is years ahead of us and probably will stay that way for quite some time, which makes policymakers super, super nervous. Um, some of the things, and it's never going to be an either or, we're not going to get rid of oil, period. That's not gonna happen. Um, and, you know, we've got too much too much of the American structure and the world for that matter invested in plastics and invested in, you know, not just, just cars. So, you know, clothing and it, there's just a whole myriad, uh, triple tiers of <clears throat> things we have to replace. So in, until we start to see real movement towards picking up those branches on the tree, so to speak, with alternatives, um, investors are going to be loath to invest in green anything. So we're going to have to have a, a consolidated, consolidated voice. I don't see that happening currently. I'm sorry to say we're very slow at it. We've been talking about it. Um, the boogeyman is at our door, and I'm afraid, in my estimation, some folks are going to have to die in order for big industry to uh, move quicker. Now, they already are. Uh, American Southwest is in its um, extreme drought phase, has been, and um, now we're talking Colorado River drying up with all the downstream um, cities um, really starting to get nervous. Um, so I'm sorry to, you know, be the bearer of bad news, but I, I can only see just like, you know, the consensus that it's going to get worse before it gets better. And until we actually start putting some leaves on that uh, alternatives tree, I can see that a few branches are going to be bare for some time. So I'm sorry to deliver that. <laughs> Yet, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy that everybody is talking about it. I would love to see networking happen a little quicker in my estimation. So appreciate the time. Thank you. I don't want to hog the stage. Thank you. Kevin, thank you. Always appreciate you. And I love all your references to the natural world in your uh, comments as always, um, but maybe you can connect with the Climate Voice crew. I'll connect everybody here. I think it would be good to get a, a back channel email thread going to put all these wonderful people together to see what magic can happen. Uh, and maybe you can help mobilize your communities to help support Bill and Jennifer's calls to action uh, and the Climate Voice team on the uh, push to corporates. Uh, but before we close, before we go to Bill and Jennifer, we have to go to Chris. So, Chris, I hope you're in a place that you can say a quick hello, make a quick comment, uh, thoughts and observations. Congratulations to me mobilizing this huge community of tech people. We need design thinkers. We need the innovation, the excitement, the, the brains of the tech folks to come into the room to help solve these problems. So we're so excited um, that we that we host these in here with you. Uh, but it would be great to hear your voice or a quick comment or question. Yeah, Andrew, I mean, well, as always, I mean, you know, exceptional moderation for, for such a, you know, interesting discussion and what I could say can be, you know, quite a passionate discussion. Um, you know, Maya as a speaker was absolutely fabulous. The questions that was brought up were amazing. Um, what really resonated with me most was, you know, especially someone who is, you know, pro-climate, um, you know, there's a difference between being pro-climate and then actually doing something within your organization or, you know, within your communities to actually make an impact. So, you know, hearing about the different ways that that could be done, um, I thought was super educational, inspiring. 
um, you know, for those in Tech Talks who want to make that change. So, you know, hear the support that 100% and, you know, the, to, to, to absolutely to Jennifer, Bill and to Sarah, you know, as always, thank you for, you know, helping putting together these discussions. I mean, for those who um, haven't checked them out, please do. Um, you know, they're amazing people, you know, team over at Climbed Voice doing amazing things. And yeah, I mean, overall, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be able to host these discussions. Uh, thank you all for being here. And thank you everyone to, you know, who, who asked amazing questions here on stage and who also participated and everyone in the audience listening. Thank you so much, Chris. And a big shout out to the Clubhouse platform that we were able to host this these important conversations and give calls to actions right here on Clubhouse. Bill and Jennifer, over to you to recap the calls to action. My last plug, don't forget to vote, register to vote, bring a friend to vote or register to vote. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Chris, again, thank you for hosting us. Andrea, for moderating. Emily, I just should thank her again. And everyone who joined the conversation I always end these feeling like we needed another hour or two or three. And, you know, Kevin, the things you raised, we didn't have time to get into. Daniel, um, particularly ra raised issues of equity, as did Maya. And we need to have more conversation and more action there. So, just final call to action, go to gotimeforclimate.com. That's the website. Check out the scorecard. See where those 20 nominally climate-friendly companies rank. And then use the tweet buttons to tell them you're watching and you care. And we've already got uh, you know, at this point, thousands of people tweeting at the companies and CEOs. We need more. So check it out, share it with your networks, and, you know, let's turn the progress we've seen so far into hopefully a real win this fall. So thank you all, and um, look forward to talking with you next time.